At the Veterans Administration Hospital, Hines, Illinois, orientation for the blind is under the close supervision and guidance of the Physical Medicine Rehabilitation Service. Here in a well-rounded program, all the necessary medical and therapeutic services are provided to aid in the reorganization of the blind patient's mode of living. Mastering the techniques of foot travel is a long and difficult struggle, a struggle in which the entire being of the individual is involved, mind, body, and will. Some have faltered, a few have lost out, but by far the greater number have mastered this form of foot travel. A great many totally and partially blinded veterans have taken part in this learning. Men of various ages, different levels of intelligence and aptitudes. Typical of the complex problems facing the newly blind is the case history of Charles McCabe. An orienter was assigned to familiarize McCabe with his room. The chief of the blind rehabilitation section, Russ Williams, is himself a blind veteran whose movements are guided only by the expert use of the long cane. As is his custom, Williams makes it a point to have a friendly talk with each new patient. From these talks, he gains important information about the patient's home life and past. Williams also endeavors to encourage McCabe on the advantages in the use of the long cane. The potential of the orientation program and what it can do for the individual is explained. In the company of another blind veteran, for the first time since his blindness, McCabe began to talk freely. But there's nothing unusual about my story. When I got back out of the hospital, I, I didn't know how to get around or anything, and People tried to help me, but it just seemed that they were pushing me around. My injury dates back to the Normandy invasion in 1944. The landmine explosion left me with only partial vision, but fortunately I had enough sight to go back to my former employment. Then about seven years later, my sight began to fail, gradually at first, but finally completely. Although this practically confined me to my home, it was okay at first. My family was glad to do things for me. They were more than willing to help. Here, Charles, I'll do it for you. Sit still, Charlie. What station do you want? Hey, Charlie, don't come down those stairs alone. You might get hurt. Charles, you know you can't go out alone. You might get hit by a car. Wait till Dad gets home. He'll take you for a walk. I soon found there was a prisoner in my own home. My overprotective family wouldn't allow me to move by myself until I wondered when they'd get fed up. I didn't have long to wait. Charles, am I going to have to wait on you hand and foot for the rest of your life? Life had reached the point where I could no longer ignore my helplessness. How long could I continue to ask my family to be my personal servants? I knew that I must do something to help myself, but what? I was blind and it just seemed the whole world had closed its eyes to my problem. I was lost. So, I don't know. It, it, I guess it's about got me licked. 
McCabe, there are no easy solutions to these problems. Here, run your hand over this cane. The long cane. The answer out of the problems of the blind. Learn to use the cane the right way. And I think, well, you begin to see daylight. You become a person again. Not someone who travels, uh, just at the convenience of others. You move of your own. Not just here in the hospital alone. In the world outside. The struggle Williams warned would... There would be days when everything would go wrong, when further effort would seem useless. But the day would come when he could recognize progress. Finally, toward completion of his 18-week course, the triumphant feeling of being able to navigate with the aid of the long cane, just as hundreds of others had done before him. And so Charles McCabe, a veteran of average health and ability, on McCabe's first day in the blind section, a therapist guided him through the cafeteria line, showing him how to find his table and the seat assigned to him. Carrying a tray full of food was a challenge. Landing it safely was a victory. Soon after his arrival, as with all incoming patients, McCabe was interviewed by the physiatrist who supervises the active blind section. Smigelski, an orientation therapist, was assigned to McCabe. The first lesson was devoted to elementary techniques, following a sighted person. Even these rudimentary teachings were new to McCabe. The hand of the blind on the elbow of his guide, with Bob a half step behind the guide. Thus, the blind individual can easily be guided by the movements of the sighted, able to anticipate and follow through on turns, steps, or curves. Next, Smigelski showed McCabe a technique for protecting the blind when navigating in familiar surroundings. His arm held in front of his chest and across his body. The upper arm at a right angle to the shoulder. The forearm parallel to the floor with fingers extended in order to protect the far side body. Next morning, Smigelski showed McCabe how to take direction from one piece of furniture. By this time, McCabe was becoming familiar with room and the location of things. To know where things were and to be able to find them was a good feeling. At the end of the lesson, Smigelski showed McCabe how to take a direct from his chair to the door and then out into the hall. Later, he arrived with the men's room. coming. McCabe learned how his arm protected him when guided only by Smigelski's voice. He also learned to trail along a wall with the back of his fingertips, counting the door facings to locate himself, and use the other hand for protection. That afternoon, Smigelski took McCabe on a tour of other areas of the hospital. It is necessary for the blind to develop a sense of hearing and smell to such a degree that sounds and odors become clues, clues that exist in a sighted person's awareness of space, clues that must be brought into sharp focus by the blind in mastering foot travel. 
two days of therapy had passed. McCabe was still unsure of himself, aware of the many difficulties in navigation, aware also of the need to interpret sounds to help compensate for the loss of sight. But on the credit side, McCabe felt he knew the general layout of the blind section and that he was making progress. The next morning, McCabe was introduced to the long cane. Smigelski showed in the cross-body technique, a technique used in familiar areas and in going up and down steps. The cane is held well up in the crook and turned outward in order to protect the patient's knuckles from possible injury. The hand holding the cane is extended about 12 to 18 inches in front of the hip in a diagonal across the body. The tip of the cane in front of the opposite foot an inch or two off the floor and past the body. McCabe learned that the cross-body technique employs the long cane as a bumper, the diagonal line of the cane across the front of his body providing protection from injury. As McCabe gained confidence, his technique improved. In the blind section, other therapeutic activities are prescribed, activities which will later prove helpful to the individual patient in his bid for independence. As a recreational activity, McCabe took up bowling and found that the game, like everything else, required practice. A general exercise program is part of the prescribed treatment for each patient in the blind section. Here he develops coordination and balance and maintains a normal degree of physical fitness. In the short time since his arrival, McCabe had become friendly with Baker, another blind veteran whose course of therapy had started a few days before McCabe's. For McCabe, this was the end of the third day. He had the optimism of one who had made a good start a feeling that the struggle was not nearly as difficult as he had pictured. The next day, McCabe embarked on the touch technique with the long cane. Okay, Mac. The crook of the cane is held well back in the palm of the hand. That's it. Feel the pressure points under the base of the thumb and on the third finger. The index finger runs along the shaft of the cane. The other two fingers don't do a thing. They're just along for the ride. Smigelski emphasized that the grip, though snug, should be relaxed. If held too loosely, the cane may flip with the wrist action. In addition, the sensitive cane tip will fail to send messages up the bearer's arm, indicating what is being touched. Now to wrist action, Mac. Hold the cane out in front of you. Move your wrist back and forth. Watch the forearm. It's rolling. Just the wrist. Pivot it. That's it. McCabe then learned the proper arm position in the touch technique, extending his elbow from the center of his body. In the beginning, 
You can't hold the cane out there too long. You're bound to get tired. You've got to find somewhere to rest your arm. The question is, where? No, that's not it. Using the hip shortens the length of the cane. It also cancels out the center position. You might as well get this now, Mac. Sliding off the center spot is a weakness of many of our fellows. That's it. On a man of your build, the upper arm presses against your chest. McCabe began to touch the cane tip from side to side with a light, pivoting motion of his wrist. Smigelski indicated the proper arc of the cane, neither too wide nor too small, approximately the width of McCabe's shoulders, thus providing protection for both sides of his body. McCabe was now ready to step out. As his left foot came forward, it sent the cane tip to his right. As his right foot came forward, the cane went to his left, and so on. That was the rhythm. McCabe began to put into practice the fundamentals of the touch technique, and his performance bore all the marks of a beginner. Poor posture, the shuffle of his feet, and a lack of rhythm. Smigelski noted these as well as other faults. The return of McCabe's habit of lifting his wrist and rolling his forearm. The gradual shifting of his elbow from the important center position, causing the arc of his cane to move also to his right. Smigelski was too wise an orienter to call McCabe's attention to all of these faults. In time, as the lessons proceeded, they would individually be worked out of his touch technique. Instead, Smigelski steered McCabe toward the wall. At the mercy of darkness, McCabe was beginning to realize the value of the long cane as a sensitive probe, his antenna to signal whether the path lay clear. The objective of McCabe's next lesson was to follow the sound of Smigelski's voice. Get that hand in the center. Your arc's a little too wide. Cut it down on the right. That's it. Keep coming. Relax. You're too tense. That's it. Check the arc again. Keep coming. Here I am. That's it. Back and forth, Smigelski maneuvered. His voice, McCabe's only guide. Circling McCabe. Later, steering him into a series of unexpected obstacles. McCabe was able to freeze successfully because his body was well balanced, flat on his feet. Still in the early stages of learning foot travel, McCabe deluded himself with the extent of his progress. And why not? Was he now able to navigate the cafeteria line on his own? As guides to his location, he used the edge of the serving counter, the warmth of the steam table, and the cold of the milk chest. Now began the long hours of hard work to improve his cane technique. So far, McCabe had learned the route to the concourse, the chapel, the physiatrist's office, and back to the corridor of the blind section.
Now and then, Smigelski corrected McCabe's technique, reminding him to keep his arm centered, to avoid the rolling motion of his forearm. The next lesson was the proper method of navigating a stairway. First, picking up the drop in the floor surface and immediately freezing. Then coming to a starting position, the cane tip on the shelf of the step with the cane centered between the navigator's feet. Next, clearing the stairway. testing the depth of the top step and its width, then navigating the stairway using the cross-body technique. The cane tip picking up the floor level at the bottom of the lowest step. Now to ascend the stairway his cane elevated to the height of the second step. Then on the third riser, as he ascends the first step, and so on up the entire stairway. Smitty? Hello, oh, McCabe, I'm Crowley. I'm your oriented this morning. Now, let's see, you're on lesson 14. In the blind section, it is the custom to rotate orienters. This provides against the regularly assigned orienter becoming habituated and thus less alert to flaws in a patient's cane technique. That day, McCabe was familiarized with various areas in the canteen. The next day, the post office, with its mail slots and service windows. then the barber shop near the concourse. During each break, McCabe was reminded of defects in his technique. You're still not getting enough cane coverage, Mac. Maybe it's the way you're elevating the wrist. Just reach out like you're shaking hands. Like that? That's right. Let's take off. The next morning, McCabe was recalled to the orientation clinic for a brush-up period, with Smigelski back as his orienter. That's better. Hey, Smig, how come? I've been through this lesson days ago. <laughs> a little underhanded work, Mac. Your buddy Baker asked me to hold your back. You're coming along too fast. Yeah, I'll bet. To McCabe, this was so much time lost. Within his mind, a seed of doubt came to life about the extent of his progress. But in the week since he had embarked on the touch technique, McCabe had improved. That evening, Baker told McCabe that he was ready to start outdoor therapy the next day. McCabe saw his chances of catching up with Baker grow dim. The next morning, he was to have an even greater setback. Keep listening, Mac. 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 Keep listening, Mac.
The Ford Booth. Remember your landmark? I believe what I say. You've got to keep the hair done. Use everything you've got. Everything. everything. Is he responsible for what's claimed in South Pass? His tenseness. Get in your eyes, don't let the moon break your heart. Love blooms at night, in daylight it dies. Don't let the stars get in your eyes, so keep your heart for me. For McCabe began to recall and feel the attitude of the other patients. Any of you guys care for any salary? Yeah, I'll take a piece, Tex. Here. Oh, keep your flowers. <laughs> I got a ten high straight. Full house. You know what Justice Holmes said? No, what did he say? No man should put his foot down unless he knows if the sidewalk is under it. What I can't figure out is why they started planting trees in the middle of the sidewalk. Why don't you look where you're going, Smitty? I'm not Smitty, I'm Woody. Don't let your blindness be a handicap, boy. What was it Ross Williams had said? Learn to use the cane the right way, and I think you'll begin to see daylight. If others could overcome their handicap, why couldn't McCabe? Nice going. Well, thank you, Smig. And so Charles McCabe reached the first level in the reorganization process of the blind patient. He had learned the fundamentals of the proper use of the long cane. The borders of McCabe's world had expanded from his bedroom, the center of his existence, to the various areas of the hospital. Meanwhile, he had maintained an excellent record of progress in the other activities of the blind section. At the end of the second week of McCabe's therapy, he was ready to go outdoors. Soberly, with a more realistic concept of what lay ahead, he met Smigelski. All of his illusions about the ease of the struggle were gone. Before McCabe laid daylight, the outside world. 